Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1. Continuing in our study right now on the Bible and booze. And I hope you'll listen very, very carefully tonight as I share the testimony of one of my friends that I grew up with. And I think you'll appreciate it. I communicated with him today and let him know that I was going to be using his testimony in tonight's Bible study. And he said, use whatever you want if it helps somebody. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. But thank you all for being here. And to our online family, we're blessed that you are with us tonight as well. Thank you for choosing to be a part. If you would like to share this with someone, hit that little share button down there if you can, if it's available. And I trust you'll listen very carefully to the entire study tonight. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, reading only one verse to begin with tonight. Reading with me out loud, please. Wine is a mocker. And strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Tonight's Bible study is entitled, The Raging Deceiver. The Raging Deceiver. Now, our Heavenly Father, I ask you to give us understanding. The psalmist prayed that. He said, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. And I realize that some of the things that will be said tonight when I think about how the Bible says that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and it's a deceiver. When I think about that, I realize there are those, many of those who have believed this lie. Lord, help us to know the truth tonight rather than the lie. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. It is evident from scripture that no good thing has ever come from drinking fermented wine and strong drink. Many will disagree with that. Lots of people will disagree with that. Many believers today will disagree with that vehemently. But since there are no contradictions in the Bible, and there are no contradictions anywhere in the Bible, God cannot condemn alcohol on one hand and then condone it on another. If he did that, that means that our God would be double-minded. And the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable. We do not have an unstable God. And all God's people said, Amen. We have a very stable God. And so, therefore, Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1 stands faithful uh, to the whole of Scripture. Alcoholic wine remains a mocker, and strong drink remains raging, And both are the great deceivers of mankind. You can take that one to the bank. The Bible has no contradictions. And it says what it means. And it means what it says. And even a casual study of the scriptures surrounding the use of wine and strong drink in the Bible shows plainly that consuming alcoholic wine and strong drink are simply not good. Just a casual look. It shows that it's not good. However, today there are still many who have swallowed the alcohol and wine lie, literally, by the bottle and by the canful. They've swallowed it, and they believe the lie. There may even be some online tonight, no one in this room I know uh, would be this way, but there are some that may be listening online that have already decided that what I read is not correct and that it is okay. And they will give example after example found in the Word of God. As one was shown to me today, of course it was out of its context, in the book of Ecclesiastes, where it said that, uh, it said that uh, drinking wine and eating food uh, was, uh, was okay and that money was the answer to all things. When I think about that, that's ex- by the way, that's what the verse basically says, but that was written by a man who was away from God. His name was Solomon. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, he gives his testimony about what life was like when he was away from God. And that was one of the conclusions that he came to, was that food and drink and money are the only thing that we really need in this life. But he found that all of that was vanity. Everything was empty. And so when I think about there, it has been said in an earlier message that wine and strong drink are liars. This is not surprising because alcohol uh, is of its father. And who is its father? One might say, are you going to say the devil? Well, the Bible says it's a liar. Let me read to you John chapter 8 and verse 44. 
It says, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And the Bible says that wine is a mocker, and strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived. And remember how we, dis- we define the word deceived? It means a lie. So the devil is the author of all of it. Amazing. Lucifer started out lying to himself and lying to God. He then lied to Eve in the Garden of Eden and encouraged her to lie to Adam. And Adam believed the lie and plunged the entire human race into a fallen, sinful condition. Satan's plan never really changes. He's all about the lie. And by the way, the lie that he told in the Garden of Eden was, he says, you can be your own God. You don't have to have a God over you. You go back and you read that in Genesis and you find out that he told Eve, ye shall be as gods, he said. Well, the lie has been around for a long time. He's the father of lies. And also the Bible says that wine and strong drink are deceivers. They're liars as well. And I just want to say this. uh, He is the great deceiver, the devil, and everything he involves himself with is full of deceit. And alcohol is not the exception to the rule. Someone will argue that, I know. Someone will talk about how they stop at the little winery and they have a little bit of cheese and maybe some crackers and, and they'll drink some maybe some red wine or they might go out with a friend and they might go to a restaurant and there they'll order their surf and turf and might order up some white wine or they might go to a wedding reception and they'll pass out the toasting champagne at the end when everybody's toasting the new couple and justify it any way they want to. But the Bible still says wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. They simply believe the lie. Alcohol has been deceiving mankind as long as man has been drinking it. I make no apology for what I say. None whatsoever. And I have friends and I know family members. Uh, uh, My extended family, as far as you want to go, I'm sure there's plenty of alcohol out there somewhere. I remember growing up as a kid, I had uh, cousins and all the rest of it. They would go down to the local store, down to the Piggly Wiggly, as it was called, down in Oneida, Tennessee. Or might go over to uh, uh, the uh, local grocery store, not just Piggly Wiggly. And they might just pick up a six-pack or a 12-pack or a 24 case of their favorite uh, cheap beer that they had down in Tennessee because nobody had money down there. And they, they would buy the Miller and the Schlitz and all the rest of it and take it. And then they would drink it. And many a time, maybe even go get some of the Tennessee whiskey because it was down in Tennessee. And then they would drink it. And I had an uncle who died of alcohol poisoning in his body, died of a heart attack. And the doctor said that when they examined him after he died right there in a store as he was checking out, they said, and I don't know how accurate this description is, but they said that his heart exploded and he had more alcohol in his veins than he did blood. Now, I know that's an exaggeration, but he was a drunk He was a drunk. So tonight what I want to do is I want to talk about the raging deceiver only in a couple of points and then with a longer illustration. Number one, if you're taking notes, I want you to see the evil effects of alcohol. And you're going to want to use your Bible, okay? You have your Bible with you tonight. And I'd like you to go, first of all, to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. We will start reading in verses 20 through 26, and I'm sure you'll get there about the time I'm starting to read. But listen to this very sad story in the word of God. It says, And Noah, in verse 20, began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard, and he drank of the wine and was drunken. So it means he fermented, he distilled this stuff and turned it into alcoholic beverage. You don't get alcohol out of a grape. You don't get alcohol out of a fig. You get alcohol out of a berry or a grape or something that has taken time to ferment. And so he took this, that he drank of the wine and was drunken and was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment 
and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father and their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. But something happened after this. It says, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son, talking about Ham's younger son, had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and, uh, and Canaan shall be his servant. What is indicated in this passage, and I double-checked this and restudied it out, but there's an illicit sexual act that was indicated here that was done to Noah. Very sad. I say, Pastor, can you substantiate that? Well, just from the passage. But I want you to also listen to this. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15. It says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink. Now, we're not talking about water here. We are talking about alcoholic beverage, whether that be wine, as the Bible says, wine is a mocker, or whether it be strong drink, as the Bible says, because the Bible says wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. And our Bible study tonight is entitled The Raging Deceiver. Habakkuk 2.15 says, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest the bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that thou mayest look upon their nakedness. So you have here that immorality is connected to the consumption of alcohol, of all things. So the evil effects of alcohol is alcohol diminishes morality. Alcohol diminishes morality. Under that, it is also associated with stubbornness, rebellion, gluttony, and dishonoring parents. Those four things. Where is that found? Deuteronomy chapter 21 and verse 20. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 20, it says, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. All of these things are associated with the drinking of alcohol, drunkenness. You see. Not only that, but drinking brings spiritual blindness and uselessness. It brings spiritual blindness and uselessness. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 7, the word of God says, but they also have erred through the wine, they have erred through wine and through strong drink and are out of the way. Did you see that? They erred through wine and strong drink. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived. They also have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision and they stumble in judgment. All that's connected to the consumption of alcoholic beverage. I hear someone saying, well, I don't get drunk when I drink it. <laughs> really? I don't know anybody that ever got drunk that didn't drink first. Hello? That's just the logic of it. Apparently, they started out with a drink. Strong drink is deceptive. Something else. Look at this. Alcohol brings hopelessness. 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 Sometimes men and women drink to forget, but listen to what the word of God says. Isaiah 22 and verse 13. And behold, joy and gladness, slaying oxen and killing sheep, eating flesh and drinking wine. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we shall die. That's no hope. Let's get drunk because we're going to die tomorrow. And alcohol doesn't give you hope. It removes hope. Because strong drink is deceptive. In fact, according to Proverbs 20 and verse 1, it is one of the main characteristics of that is that of deceitfulness. Let's say it again. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby, deceived, there, deceived, there, deceived, thereby, deceived thereby, is not wise. The verses that we just read a moment ago speak of that lack of judgment and wisdom. Think about this. Great amounts of precious food are destroyed so that strong drink can be extracted from the rubbish. I think about alcoholic beverages are distilled from many selected vegetables and grains and fruits and all the rest of it. 
Uh, who was it that had the song, Old Dogs and Children and Watermelon Wine? <laughs> yeah, all kinds of things. When we were in Tennessee a long time ago, when I was just a little kid, they opened up a shed that had been locked for years and years and years. They found a bottle of blackberry wine that had been in there for 25 years. It was probably just about vinegar, but they had it in there. I just remember that. Blackberries are good, but I don't think I would want to drink the blackberry wine or elderberry wine or anything else. Nations are deceived by alcohol because of the vast amounts of revenue they receive through the production and sale. You think about the Kennedy family and all the money that they made because Joe Kennedy was a, was a man who dealt with alcohol. We read a moment ago, woe unto them that gives his, mother, his brother drink, uh, gives his friend drink, and that lifts a bottle and hands a bottle to him. There's a curse on those who offer drink to others. That's why uh, if somebody wants to go out to eat with us and I'm paying for their meal and they want to buy alcohol, I won't pay for it. It's just not going to happen. That's why when I was a teenager, listen, I was not a real wise teenager, but I had a little bit of common sense. But I knew the principle behind woe unto them that will give his neighbor drink. <clears throat> and that's why when I worked in the drugstore, I did not ring up alcohol. I would not ring it up because I would not be responsible to, for making that it possible for that person to have alcohol. I think about how friends are deceived as many relationships are made on the basis of social drinking, and that is a worthless counterfeit for real friendship. I think about at the first, listen to this, I wrote this on purpose. At the first, alcohol allows you to hold it, but as time goes by, it requires you to hold it. And after that, those who drink refuse to let it go because it holds them. Let me give it to you again. At the first, alcohol allows you to hold it. Social drink, can of beer, glass of wine, a little bit of brandy at the bottom of a snifter or whatever it might be. At first, you hold it because it allows you to. But then as time goes by, it requires you to hold it. you got to have it. got to have it. And after that, those who drink refuse to let it go because it holds them, you see. So the first point that I gave you tonight was the evil effects of alcohol. Secondly, the folly of alcohol. The folly of alcohol. Alcohol is full of mischief and folly. It's really amazing. It mocks its users. Isn't that something? The Bible says wine is a what? Mocker. It mocks those who drink it. And, by, and it promises satisfaction, and it promises happiness, and it promises social this, and you know, acceptance by friends, and it promises all of those things. And the truth of the matter is, those are things that alcohol can't deliver. It just can't, because why? It's a deceiver. It mocks its users by pretending to be a social thing. I'm going to sit down with my friends and have a beer at the ball game, have a tailgate party. I'm going to invite some friends over. We're going to serve steak and red wine. We're going to have fish and white wine. We're going to go to a wedding and we're going to drink champagne. It's all these social things. Individuals think it makes them socially acceptable when in reality it makes them unfit for society. Socially acceptable? They're neither. They're not social and they're not acceptable. Don't you just love being around a drunk or someone that smells like alcohol? We've all been there, haven't we? Been around somebody that drinks. I had a cousin who's now passed away, but he, uh, he wanted to try a new beer out. He drank 12 cans of it one night, just decided he didn't like it. I bet he was a social mess. Most folks cannot talk or socialize and drink at the same time. And certainly no one is encouraged to drink and drive at the same time. They don't ever say, yeah, get out there and drive. When you see a commercial or you read an ad, it always says, drink responsibly, don't drive when you're drinking, get us. And what do they say at New Year's? They always say, make sure you've got a designated driver. And what is it about the law agency here in Colorado Springs area that if you're drunk, they say, call them, they'll drive you home? Why? Because they don't want you on the road. You don't have any common sense driving with you got alcohol in you. See, alcohol makes the tongue abusive and removes whatever controls a person may have in their passions. We've already read about that. Started in Genesis and went down into the prophets. Those who are deceived by alcohol are simply not wise, the Bible says. It's a mocker. It's raging. 
and those who are deceived by it are not wise. The Bible warns, warns about the effects of alcohol time and time again. And I'm really convinced that those who claim to know Jesus as their Savior and claim to read their Bible, I think these are the passages that they skip over. Or they don't believe them. Or it's kind of like the homosexual Bible that's out. It's called the Queen James Bible. It's a real Bible. It's on, you can buy it at the different bookstores. It's a, it's a real one. And uh, how do they get past the verses in the Old Testament and the New that condemn homosexuality and lesbianism and bestiality? I think people who justify drinking overlook those verses about alcohol in the same way that the homosexual crowd overlooks the verses that condemn homosexuality. And by the way, homosexuality is condemned in the Bible, and so is lesbianism, and so is bestiality, or bestiality, however you'd like to pronounce it, and so is drunkenness, and so is alcohol, and so is disobedient to parents, and so is witchcraft, and so is drug abuse. It's all there. It's all condemned by the Word of God. The Bible warns about the effects of alcohol time and again only to be ignored by those who have believed alcohol's lie. For example, it, it is the fool who ignores all the road signs that tells him that the bridge is out. Ah, I can go a little further. Or ignores that little gas gauge in your car that the little light comes on. And uh, you don't, you, none of you hardly know how much gas you've got left in your tank. I listened to an old-time radio program years ago, and uh, they were traveling on a country road, which, by the way, was the name of the program that it was on, old-time radio, on a country road, one of my favorite ones. And the gas gauge in the car was on E. And she said to him, your gas gauge is on E. He said, I know. I said, I've always got a couple of gallons left. Kaput, 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 kaput. Not paying attention to the signs, you see. The fool plunges headlong over the edge, and it's in the same way, it's the fool who knows all the warnings along the roadside about alcohol and chooses to drink anyway. He's a fool. Now I want you to go back to the verse in Isaiah 28 and verse 7. Isaiah 28 and verse 7. Because this verse speaks of the drinking of alcohol, and it says, but they also have erred. That's important. They erred through wine. It did not say they erred through drunkenness. I want you to notice that. Sometimes it's just as important what the Bible does not say. It did not say that they erred through drunkenness. It said they erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They have swallowed up the, of, of, the, of wine. They are out of the way though strong, through strong drink. They err in vision, they stumble in judgment. Now, the implication is they're talking about drunkenness. But the Bible doesn't mention drunkenness. It says it was the wine and the strong drink that changed them. And so, and so here's something else. The heart that you have for God will be lost through wine and strong drink. Listen to this. If you can find it fast enough, Hosea chapter 4 and verse 11. The Bible says, whoredom and wine and new wine take away the heart. Wow. So here you have alcoholic beverage, getting drunk, drinking, whether it be social or whether it be alone in your home while sitting in your easy chair in front of the fireplace. It doesn't matter. It, did you see it's connected with whoredom and losing your heart? I'm not even going to ask you to tell me who you know who through alcohol has lost their heart for God by justifying their drink. Now, preaching against the sin of immorality is something that Christians don't mind. If I were to get up here and talk about whoredoms and prostitution and, and talk about uh, all the sexually transmitted diseases that come along because of immorality and all the rest of it, if I were to lambaste uh, homosexuality and lesbianism and bestiality and all the rest of it, you all wouldn't mind, even though you don't want to hear those words. And I don't like saying them either, by the way. It's like, amen, preacher, preach against that. Yeah, I can do that. Harlotry, prostitution, but, but no one has respect for that area 
in the town called the Red Light District when I was a uh, when I was in college in 1976, we took a trip to Boston, Massachusetts, and we were helping a man start a church in Canton. His name, by the way, was, well, never mind what his name was, because I don't even know if he's in the ministry anymore. But we helped him start a church, and we had to drive through a bad part of town, and they said, this is the combat zone. And the combat zone was the red light district in Canton, Massachusetts. The combat zone because it was filled full of prostitution and whoredoms and and, uh, and all the rest of it, whoremongering. The words prostitute, prostitution, whore, and pimp are words that we associate with the worst of sins. But according to Hosea 4.11, wine and strong drink have the same effect. They take away the heart. Wine and strong drink will render those who are deceived by them incapable of getting wisdom. And for alcohol is a sin that so captivates an individual that it actually takes away his heart. And it does. Now, I want to bring this Bible study to a conclusion tonight with the illustration. I have two illustrations I want to share with you, one from history and one from my own friend's life. I want to close the message with the following story told by General Harrison, one of the candidates for the presidency of the United States many years ago, in connection with a public dinner given for him on one occasion. Here's what he said, and I quote, this is all that he said. He says, at the close of the dinner, one of the gentlemen drank to his health, and the general pledged his toast by drinking water. Another gentleman offered a toast and said, General, will you not favor me by taking a glass of wine? The general, in a very gentlemanly way, begged to be excused. He was again urged to join in a glass of wine. This was too much. He rose from his seat and said in the most dignified manner, Gentlemen, I have twice refused to partake of the wine cup. I hope that will be sufficient. Though you press the matter ever so much, not a drop shall pass my lips. I made a resolve when I started in life. Now that's interesting because Daniel, when did he make his decision about not consuming the king's wine and the king's meat? Early. And here's what this general, here's what General Harrison said. I made a resolve when I started in life that I would avoid strong drink. That vow have I never broken. I am one of a class of 17 young men who graduated together. The other 16 members of my class now fill drunkard's graves and all from the pernicious habit of wine drinking. I owe all my health, my happiness, and prosperity to that resolution. Would you urge me to break it now? End quote. Personal testimony from him. As I said at the beginning of this Bible study, no good thing has ever come from the drinking of alcoholic beverages. It just doesn't. And again, even a casual study of Scripture shows that God does not want us to be controlled by, and you get controlled by it by starting to drink it. You don't take the first step if you don't want to end up in the ditch. You just don't do that. And he doesn't want us to be influenced in any way by alcohol, the great deceiver. Now, the following, I'm going to read it word for word, is an email exchange with my friend John, who responded to an outline he received from me many years ago. John said, My family were a bunch of slobbering drunks, and having seen all that bad that came from it, I never had the desire to drink. I said, I guess I never really knew that, about, uh, that part about your family. I'm sad that you had to endure the evils of alcohol. John says, I thought everybody knew. I tried to hang out at your house as much as I could. You were my best friend. And it was always amazing to see a normal, loving family actually getting along. John then said, my dad would beat on me when he was drunk. Sometimes I was really guilty of something. Sometimes I was just in the wrong place. I still have scars on my back from the buckle end of that belt. It was a good thing when he had his stroke in 1966. No more beatings. I never shed a tear when he died in 1968. He goes on to say, My mom would just sit and cry when she drank. She mostly liked wine. She threw me out very young. I never shed a tear over her either. He goes on to say, My sister drank a lot and had sex with anything that moved. She had a baby at 15 
uh, that was given away. She was drunk when she had the car incident that killed her at the age of 40 and her husband around 1985. I offered to have her daughter come live with me and my boys, but she was all but she was already wild and said I had too many rules, so she stayed in Florida. He then goes on to say, this is why I have never drank any alcohol. Of all the evil things I have done in my life, I have never drank or smoked. I can certainly see behind the TV shows and ads that tell you that how, what fun it is. I know better. People need to know that what they see on TV and movies is not real, and there is nothing funny or entertaining about drinking. I tried to emphasize what he emphasized in his writing. I communicated with him just today. I told him I would use that illustration. He said it was perfectly okay for me to do. John did come to our house, and he hung around us. He loved my mom and dad. He loved me. I'm not sure he loved my brother as much, but I know that he loved me. But he wanted to be around a normal family because he never had a normal family. Alcohol destroyed him. In fact, I did not include here what he wrote to me today, but he said alcohol destroyed my family. And it's true. One might argue and say, well, it wasn't alcohol that destroyed them. It was, it was their lack of character. They, did, they couldn't control it. No, they couldn't control it because after a while it controls you. And it never starts out that way. It starts off with a drink, something social, something not very alcoholic. It starts off with, oh, years ago there was Boone's Farm, a very low alcohol content wine. They had different flavors that they had. I never tasted it, but I heard people talk about it. But that's just like marijuana. It's an entryway drug. It's something that gets you started drinking. Because then you got to have more. Because what you got at first was not enough. And that's my Bible study for tonight, is the raging deceiver. And there are so many today who claim to know Christ, and I don't doubt their salvation. I don't doubt their salvation at all. But I do know this, they justify the drinking of alcohol. Brother Newport started a, a business that had a restaurant in that motel, and he refused to serve alcohol. I say to Brother Newport, amen. That went out of business because people wanted alcohol. Well, and he was, he was urged to serve alcohol. And he put his foot down and said, I will not serve alcohol, and did not serve alcohol. And I admire you for that. You may have lost the business, but you kept your Christian character. And I praise the Lord for that. So anyway, I want you to be thinking about it. You folks who are online tonight, I don't know what your ideas are about it. You might even have a bottle of bubbly sitting in the cabinet right now or a six-pack of beer somewhere. I'm just going to urge you, I'm going to urge you to do this. I'm talking to my church family right now, but I'm going to direct this to my online family. I want you to consider what we said in the Bible study tonight. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to suggest you take seriously the verses that we read through tonight from the Word of God and apply them to maybe your personal situation. I love my friends who are online. I really do. And that's why we keep ministering online. It's because there's a great deal of love for you. And I want to be able to minister to you as well. But tonight's Bible study was not just me blowing smoke. We read these things in the Word of God, and according to the Bible, there's just no good thing that comes from it. And I trust that what you'll do is take me seriously. To my church family, shall we stand?